everybody. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. I would like to welcome everybody from different countries, different time zones, and those who are watching this live recording, who could not manage to come, but willing to learn more about smart cities. Uh, this is based on your feedback. This live is based on your feedback and requests. And uh, we continue our live of the digital transformation live sessions. We will talk uh, on this session about the smart cities. I am Lela Machaidze. I am professional project manager. I'm originally from Georgia and I have customers from different countries. Uh, I am in project management for more than 70 years, and I'm passionate about everything related to the future of project management. So if you want to learn more about me, you can follow me on the LinkedIn or Facebook in, or Instagram, Instagram, where I post interesting uh, tips and tricks about project management. Uh, I would like to uh, cover um, a few uh, agenda topics. Uh, today's session will continue for 45 minutes, followed with 15 minutes of Q&A sessions. Uh, please uh, feel free to use chat for the questions and for uh, answers and for the topics you would like to cover, and we will uh, address them during the Q&A session. The recording of this video will be posted on our YouTube so you can watch it later or share with your friends and colleagues. Digital transformation is affecting not only uh, the education that we covered in our previous session, but also covering uh, the cities, the places where we live and where, where our uh, future uh, and where our uh, kids will be living. So uh, I'm really pleased and I would like to welcome and I'm really thrilled to welcome to this live uh, one of the uh, global thought leaders in, on smart cities author of the bestseller book, Smart Cities for Dummies, Jonathan Reckenthal. I'm glad, I'm glad to have you here. How are you doing today? Well, I'm doing great and I'm glad to be here. You know, this is my, uh, uh, this is my inaugural uh, event in Georgia. I've never spoken in Georgia before. So uh, <laughs> I'm very happy to be here and to be with all of you. Uh, in, in Georgia and around the region. And by the way, uh, to all those uh, joining from all parts of the world, I'm, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity oh, yeah. to have, to have this conversation with you, you, Leila. I'm glad to have you here. And the digital transformation is very hot topic uh, in Georgia as well as well in all over the countries so, uh, in, in the world. So the first topic and the first question that I would like to ask is that how would you define a smart city? Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question in that uh, if you asked uh, 15 uh, people who were, uh, you know, working in this space, they would all give you different uh, answers. I often say that uh, the definition is much less important than the uh, outcomes, is the intention. What, what are we trying to achieve? Um, you know, <clears throat> What's important to understand is the context of this topic, and that'll lead to a definition. I, I, and, and I'm glad you asked because that's the right framing for this, uh, the, our next questions and how we talk about this. Um, you know, we are an urban planet now, uh, whether we like it or not, right? We are over 50%, almost 60% of the planet lives in uh, cities. It's quite a recent phenomena for most of human history. We were a rural species, you know, we, we lived in the countryside, we were hunter gatherers and then farmers and we lived in villages. But now in the 21st century, we are uh, absolutely uh, a citizens of cities. And, and it looks like that's only going to increase in, in the decades ahead, right? As we, as we get into the middle of the 21st century, we're up to about 70% or more of all humans. So, I say that our future belongs to cities. And the question is, are we ready? Are we ready for a human future that is firmly placed in the context of urbanization? And so what we want to do to answer that, to answer that question is we want to prepare our cities and build cities that are ready for the future. We want to use, we want to have cities that uh, encourage 
inclusiveness so everybody can prosper, right? Where there's more equity and equality. We want things like a clean environment, right? We want clean air and clean water. We want abundant clean energy, uh, employment opportunities. So we, we have desires and we have, you know, very urgent needs. And how we get there through new ideas and new technologies, that's what it means to be smarter. And if we can start to deploy better ideas and better solutions in the 21st century, we're building smart cities. And in fact, we're building smarter and more sustainable cities. So in a summary, when, we, when you ask the question, what is a smart city? It, it is building a city that reflects the needs of a particular community, because every community is often different, right? right. The, the needs in Tbilisi are different from Paris and New York City and even San Francisco, where I am. Um, and so it reflects it. And we use innovation, new ideas, building new value. And there's going to be a large component of technology that's engaged. So hopefully that sets the context and, and really helps us understand why should we care? Why should we care? We should really care because this is our future. And this is our future, and we have to lay the foundation for this future. We should care for the beginning to set this uh, rules right. So this drives me to the next questions. So sure. the concept, hesitant world, I understand it should be customized by cities, that, uh, by cities and areas and regions, but what are the basics? What are the main basics required for the city to become smart? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a good one. It's a question I get asked a lot. Um, well, I, I think what's very important is that there is a recognition of the need to innovate in our communities, right? And that comes not only from the community itself, but it needs to come from leadership. So you have both top-down leadership, but also bottom-up, grassroots leadership as well. If a community is not interested, if a leader doesn't recognize it's important, then, then you've nothing to start with. You, 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 you have to start with this. And part of my mission, as I travel around the world, pre-COVID, right now I'm doing it virtually, but I will resume getting in front of mayors and city managers and all sorts of people who are uh, you know, very passionate about their communities. I ask them, you know, do you recognize the need? Do you recognize that we need to do things differently if we want better and different outcomes. So first of all, leadership and a decision to move forward. Now, once you get beyond that, and that's a really important, by the way, hurdle to get over, and you have a recognition, that's when you start to be able to do things like seek investment and start to budget for it and start to allocate resources, right? So the question is, what, what, what do we do? Well, in my work, um, first of all, the list is very, very long. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's probably no surprise, right? But I will say there's four areas that, um, that are very consistent around the world and need immediate attention, right? So this is helpful. If you want to kind of understand the, 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 the four and plus one, by the way, I'm going to give a plus one, hopefully, if I remember. The first one is digitalization. Mm -hmm. Digitalization, right? Uh, too much of our interface between community and government in a city context is analog, is paper-based, right? Um, is inefficient. Um, you know, you <laughs> if you work with government on three different things, you probably are going to work on three very different systems. You're going to have three different logins <laughs> and passwords, right? Data will not move between systems. There's no really good enterprise architecture. Um, and uh, the experience, the user experience is probably not going to be like what you experience when you're in the, in the, in the private sector, you know, when you use the stuff that you love using at home or in your, in your work. So digitalization, the movement from an analog city experience to a digital world, I think is not only uh, a, a big way that's visible, but can make a huge difference and is very accessible for communities. The second one is uh, the energy revolution, the energy revolution. And, you know, look, I don't need to convince you guys. This is a really smart bunch of people. My guess is you realize that we can't keep harvesting, you know, carbon 
from underneath the earth in our mountains and 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 see the destruction that's happening on our on our environment on our air and our climate um we can't continue to do that we can't we can't accelerate that we have to transition to non-carbon and the good news story there is we're doing that we're doing that and and the reason why that's important is in this context well, is it is our cities that are the biggest consumers now of energy and will be the largest consumer of energies in the future. So if we're going to make a difference, if we're going to clean up the environment and uh, we're going to have clean, abundant energy, it's going to happen in our communities. <clears throat> the third one will be transportation. Transportation. Now, look, again, you know, this is often topics, you know, digital transformation can be sometimes quite abstract. But I can assure you, if you drove to an event or drove to school or went to your office uh, or, or, you know, just went outside or, you know, other than maybe some quietness because of COVID, in a normal working day, you can see the problems with transportation, right? Inefficient, congestion, pollution, accidents, can't find a parking space, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we know all the pains of transportation. Um, cities is where the action is. This is where the transportation is happening. Uh, we're seeing already massive change in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the introduction of electric vehicles. Uh, soon we'll see a lot of autonomous vehicles. We're seeing drones be introduced to the picture, more light rail and public transport and high speed rail. <clears throat> the fourth one is sustainability. Mm -hmm. Sustainability. Now, I say sustainability in the largest sense. So I'm not just talking about the environment, which is huge, right? We're in the beginning years of a climate emergency. Let's be real about that with very, very dire consequences. We're going to fix this or going to manage this problem in our cities because it's our cities that are creating the most amount of carbon emissions, um, things like our buildings and our industry and our factories, right? Um, but sustainability is all about green spaces, right? It's all about having parks and places to go where people can enjoy their communities, where they can um, they can meet and, and gather with their families and friends. It's about having uh, rivers and uh, uh, streams that are clean uh, and beautiful. Um, it's also about having economic conditions which serve everybody and don't focus on a 1% of, of people. So that's the fourth one, the sustainability one, and, and a big one. The plus one that I remembered, which is good, probably because it's the morning, um, is data is data. And, and this is the answer, by the way, to the question, what can we do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Because when I'm on these kind of events and city leaders are maybe on or entrepreneurs are on, or just people who are interested in improving their community, they're like, Jonathan, all this seems very big and complicated, right? <laughs> you know, I, I can't build a new car. You know, I can't uh, build a uh, farm of solar panels. What can I do? What can I do? Well, we might get to that. But the area that is very accessible to every government in the world, every city government, is the utilization of data. Now, I've said it many times, in government life, everything is in scarcity. There's never enough people like with skills. Uh, there's never enough money. There's too many projects, you know, too many priorities. Everything is in scarcity. But the one thing that we have an abundance in government is data. We have an abundance of it. And the bad news story is we barely take advantage of it, right? Now, the private sector recognizes it. The private sector has said, hey, we get the value of data. We're going to use it to, to drive new products and services and become more optimized and do all the cool stuff and innovation that's happening in the private sector. Government has been slow in this. But I see some good signs. I see some good signs of cities starting to use data to make better decisions. Right? to understand the behavior of the community, to understand things like climate, the climate emergency or the uh, or energy use or, or building management uh, or create even apps and solutions using existing data. So that becomes for me the plus one, the fifth sort of leg of what makes a community uh, smarter and where can governments begin to go on that journey. Of course, there's lots more, but let me uh, uh, send it back actually, to you. Data is actually the one of the basics to start about thinking. Of course, after the willingness and desire to be a smart city and to move toward the digitalization. But now when we talk about the data, here comes the next question about data security 
and also the privacy, who is the owner of this data and how this data can be used. <laughs> what do you think about this? Yeah, well, <clears throat> we must keep these questions top priority and we must act on them. Um, I will say for the record, and I said many times, for me, a smart city is not a surveillance city, is not a surveillance city. I'm opposed to that. I don't think that's in our interest. And I don't think that's where things need to go. Now, we are going to have more sensors. There are going to be more cameras. There's going to be more sensors that detect things like human movement, air quality, water quality, noise. We're going to have a lot more sensors. In fact, our cities are the ultimate platform for the Internet of Things, for connecting a lot of different things and collecting um, data. So we are absolutely elevating or escalating even the, uh, the, the risks involved in information security and also the problems of ensuring that we can have uh, an agreed amount of privacy uh, for, our, for our communities. So recognizing that the attack vectors, the actual problems of uh, cybersecurity are increasing in our communities and also the sensitivity our communities have to privacy, we have to act on it. We have to make that a, a priority. And unfortunately, often, and this even happens in the private sector, we are so excited about innovation <laughs> that we lose the focus on things that are also important, like privacy and like cybersecurity, right? So um, it's going to take a mix of things. Number one is it takes leadership and we, it needs technical expertise. When we build solutions for our communities, when we build those, I want to see baked into the design what we're going to do about securing the data mm -hmm. and also ensuring privacy. Let's bake that into the actual architecture. But we also need to require our vendors to do that too. And some of that will require legislation. For example, here in, in the United States, here in, in California, uh, we have state legislation that has requirements for vendors who sell technology that has a, you know, a, 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 a potential for uh, uh, a, a, a cybersecurity issues. They have to meet certain requirements. So that, that's good news. We're progressing on that. Um, <clears throat> so making it a priority, making sure the technology is designed for security, uh, but also, you know, cities have to have a cybersecurity strategy. Uh, I have my own personal experience with that. When I started managing the tech in a, in a community about 10 years ago, when I was the CIO and CTO for a community, um, and I can say this now because it's already 10 years, <laughs> there was no cybersecurity. I was, I was kind of shocked having come from the private sector and I said, you know, who's the cybersecurity manager? Where are the, where's the documentation? <laughs> where's the strategy? You know, and it was all reactive. It was like, well, if we have a problem, we'll respond. You know, and, and you look at things like, for example, antivirus software and anti-malware software and firewalls. Is it all up to date? Is it all patched and up to date, right? Um, so anyway, look, it, it was what it was when I got there. And then I made it a priority. The first executive decision I made as a, as a city leader was to hire a cybersecurity manager. Good decision. It was a really good decision. And then we budgeted. We put aside the money because we had to. We knew we had to uh, uh, invest in um, modern, upgraded firewalls, both software and hardware. We had to upgrade the software in our machines. We had to uh, start to have a training program. Training people need to know what to look out for and how to respond to threats. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll sort of summarize real quick and say, uh, if you are a city anywhere in the world today and you are not making cybersecurity priority, you're basically saying, come on, attack us. We're going to have problems. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have too many examples of that here in the U.S. We have a city, major cities like Atlanta and Georgia. U.S. Georgia, <laughs> the state of Georgia, the U.S. <laughs> the uh, the uh, city of Baltimore you know, in Maryland, another state, these cities were shut down for weeks, some of them for weeks. Not only did they shut down major services, but it costs millions of dollars to get back up to service. So the problem is the, uh, the, the lack of focus, the solution is focus, right? Yeah, I see. And when we talk about the smart cities, well, uh, which cities 
from developing country come to your mind, what they have implemented unique that you can mention and how they differ? Yeah. <clears throat> lots and lots of examples. It's always difficult to pick, you know, what, what, uh, what makes sense here. There's a couple of ways that I think about cities becoming smarter and more sustainable communities. Uh, one is you've got cities who do interesting projects. They will have a, um, you know, they'll, do, they'll have a drone service for uh, meals, maybe uh, mm-hmm. to deliver food. Uh, they they um, may have, um, you know, interesting apps for reporting issues uh, like uh, graffiti or, or stolen bicycles or something. Um, then you have a category of cities who, uh, this is a unified, comprehensive, multi-decade approach, right? And, and just to be completely, Comp, you know, uh, fall in my breakdown of categories. You've got another category of cities not doing anything. You're really not focusing on this at all for a variety of reasons. Um, so, you know, er, it, it's a pretty good bet that some city has some interesting experiment. And I don't think that it really offers a lot of value to you or the, you know, the group here. What really is important is, as I said very early on in my uh, talking points here today, is it, that the city has made a decision that their future depends on being smarter and more sustainable. They have said, we're going to have a strategy. We're going to get the strategy approved. We're going to invest dollars. We're going to uh, hire the right people. This is a concerted all hands on deck effort. And, and I think those cities in the world, there's, there's not very many of them. That is a smaller group. Now um, you can look at the world and depending how you measure it, um, there, there's a number of, you know, we, we can identify cities around the world. The number that I like to settle on is about 10,000. There's about 10,000 cities in the world. If we, just, if we define them, you know, with more than 50,000 people, a certain amount of people per square uh, kilometer, you know, there's certain characteristics. We say 10,000. Um, and if you think about the cities that have comprehensive strategies, that are you know top to bottom, left to right, you know that address transportation, buildings, uh, you know public safety, you know on and on. Out of that, there's maybe a few hundred. So you can see it's still a very small, a very small group. Um, some of the communities, some of the cities that come to mind. Now, some of the obvious ones are easy. Uh, Singapore. Now, Singapore is uh, an obvious one because it's not only a city but it's a city state, right? They have to have and they've done really good at uh, developing an efficient city that delivers good services, uh, that creates employment opportunities for everybody, has housing for people, has relatively good transportation, you know, has a focus on the environment. Um, they are starting, they are doing things across the board and they're investing. It's a smaller, you know, a target. Um, the Scandinavian cities, Helsinki, um, uh, Copenhagen, these are cities who uh, have been doing this for a while. This is not new, as it is with many others. And they have focused on things like sustainability as a priority. You know, how can we take cars off the road? How can we create placemaking? How can we accelerate the movement from carbon to non-carbon energy? You know, and they've done really good in their, uh, in their allocation of how much percentage of energy consumed in the city is is delivered by solar and wind and, you know, other forms of uh, non-carbon. Um, uh, big focus on getting people on bicycles and <laughs> getting people walking, right? Um, those, uh, those cities have been uh, pretty, pretty striking. Um, just kind of going around the world a little bit, um, down in Melbourne, Australia, uh, and even in Brisbane, Australia, just got the Olympic Games for the, the 2032. And, you know, they're doing really neat things to... Uh, uh, to provide good transportation options, uh, more digital services, digitizing a lot of things, um, you know, focusing on the environment as well. Uh, Dubai in the United Arab Emirates and up and coming is Abu Dhabi. Uh, also cities that uh, are saying our future depends on innovation and on digitalization. Uh, a project in Dubai, which is absolutely fascinating, is what they call the, the paperless the paperless project. And uh, their leader there, uh, city leader and nation leader, said that by a date specific, coming up actually here in the early 2020s, um, all government services will be paperless. 
right? And so you might say, well, that's cool because, uh, you know, less paper, less harm to the environment, but it goes way, way beyond that. Services that are moved from analog to digital are remarkably more efficient, <laughs> right? They're a better experience. They actually reduce costs and they reduce errors as does a lot of digital transformation, the theme of your talks. Um, so, so Dubai is another good one. Uh, let me just give you a couple other quick examples. Dublin in Ireland, you know, the smart Dublin effort really has kicked up a notch. Uh, they've been doing something interesting where they have what are called smart districts. Uh, not unique to, the United, uh, to Ireland, but certainly um, they are uh, doubling down on this idea of neighborhoods and areas that have specific focuses for innovation, on services, on employment, um, on experimentation, which is really key to advancing our cities. Um, and so they have what's called a smart Docklands. So their Docklands area uh, uh, is, uh, is, being, is being really invigorated by bringing in uh, startups and innovation, new ideas and experimenters and academics. This is a, this is a really uh, uh, fascinating uh, uh, development. Um, uh, no doubt, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably missing a few that are worth mentioning, but in the short time we have, I think those are some good examples. I saw the example of the Palo Alto when there was a, a city parking installed and you were C uh, CIO uh, at that time, I believe you were actually leading this effort. Yes, uh, no, 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 thank you. Yes, we, we, um, I, I don't like to, you know, necessarily speak about my own projects. Uh, but when I was the CIO, we, we deployed um, almost 300, about 275 smart city projects successfully over seven years, um, transforming a lot of the services for the community and, and digitizing, digitizing a lot of services. Well, digita uh, digitalization comes in the cities where different types of people live. So we have kids, we have elder, we have IT literally, and those who are not really familiar IT world. How do you believe this should be handled by the local government? Yeah, it's very, it's, it's, it's a, you know, I, I moved into the uh, uh, city life, having had a career already in the private sector. And in the private sector, uh, typically, you are a organization which is focused on uh, a, a finite set of products and services. In many cases, a company has one service or one product, um, and everybody is marching towards being successful in, in, in shipping as much product and service as you can. And, you know, it, it's, it's hierarchical. The, the, the CEO says, this is where we're headed, and everyone marches in that direction. When I moved into the public sector, when I moved into a city, very different life. And people ask me, Jonathan, what's different between working in a government and working in a private company? And I would answer that question. It took me a while to have a good answer. My answer was, you know what? A lot of it is the same. A lot of it, when you are an IT professional, a technology professional, you have to run email, you have to run databases, you have to run services, you know, things have to work. You have to have a help desk. You got to do backups. So this all overlaps. A city, at the end of the day, is like a big business, right? It's like a big company. It's more complicated often. But there is a distinction in who you serve, right? In the private sector, you're basically choosing your customers. You're saying, we want to go after that customer, and we're going to target our marketing on that customer. In a city, you don't choose your customers. You have to serve everybody. And that's a very different, very different proposition. You have to think entirely different about how you build services, how you reach people. And I see some of the comments there on the chat, how you bring people into the conversation, how you engage people, how you do get consensus. Absolutely, these are important. And the stakeholder group is much more massive. As an example, if you are a city leader today and you are digitalizing your services, and you're saying, this is great. We're taking something that used to be really a bureaucratic nightmare. <laughs> right? It was lots of paperwork and people had to come to a building and they had to wait for two hours. And you know what? It's going to be digital now. All you have to do is go on your computer or go on your phone and do the service. Well, that's all good. But what about people who don't use the internet? 
Or what about people who don't know how to use digital services? And let's be fair, there's a lot of those people and we have to be kind to those people. And we have to recognize that uh, not all of society is digital and likes digital. So now you have to provide an alternative. You still have to have perhaps a form on a piece of paper. You still have to have a telephone service. So when you call a number, <laughs> a human being answers and says, how can I help you, right? That you have a human. So let's get back to your question. As we develop smarter and more sustainable cities, it doesn't mean a 100% focus every single minute on digitalization and technology and progress and innovation. A lot of it is that, but we also have to say, how do we serve everybody? How do we bring everybody into a conversation? How do we create more equity and equality across our society? And that requires us to think very differently. We're going to have to have analog and digital. We're going to have to have, you know, uh, help for people who uh, need to use uh, autonomous vehicles when they're used to having, you know, driving themselves or, or getting picked up by a human being. Um, so I, in, in many ways, the question of how do we make sure that our cities serve children and grown-ups and elderly and sick people, the question of how do we do this becomes now much more important. It's always been important, but I think now it's really important in a world that's rapidly moving forward. Do you think there should be a department or some unit in the structure of the local governance that should be focused on the digital transformation or about the smart cities, how to transform the city to the, to the smart city? <clears throat> well, a lot of the technology efforts often fall into the IT organization. And, and I'll tell you something interesting. When I was hired by the city of Palo Alto, the birthplace of Silicon Valley here in California, back in 2011, my title was chief information officer or chief technology officer. And um, I was the first one with that title and I was reporting directly to the city manager. And I would have the opportunity to speak to community members and even you know, uh, begin to speak at events uh, for people who were interested in this topic. And the question I used to get very quickly and very, you know, and often in my early years was, why does a city have a CIO? Why does a city need a technology leader, right? And in a way, this, my reaction was twofold. One was, um, that's a surprising question. I was thinking this in my head. It's like, well, of course, well, you know, of course there should be CIO. But then the, the, the next thing I thought was, that's a good question for people to ask. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my, my story that's related to that. <clears throat> when I first joined public service and I was a CIO, a small community group asked me to come to uh, one of their houses in the, in, in the community and, and they would like to ask me questions. And, and I said, I'd love to. That's, it's very important as a, as a government leader to be in and engaged in your community. Absolutely. So I went to the house and there was about 15 uh, leaders of the community in the house. And they were very nice. And we, we had uh, some cookies and coffee and we were having a nice conversation. And then they asked me, uh, they wanted to ask me some formal questions. So I was expecting, you know, uh, they were going to ask me, what am I going to do about this problem or this? And they did. But then the leader of the group asked me a question, uh, a very insightful question. And she said, why does a city need a CIO if all the city does in, in, in technology is have a website? and have email. And I, my, my thought in my head again, I just not that word was, are you crazy? Is that, you know, you, you think the entire electronics, the entire technology of the city is our email system and a website? And then I thought like this last time I said, well, I guess for you, that is what you think because that's all you see, it's all you know. And I said, I have a job to do to convince, not only convince, but share the complexity and scale of work that's required to run a city in the 21st century using technology. And it was a wake up to me. It was like, wow, you know, this is not unique to me or my city. This must be happening in cities all over the world. People don't understand how their cities work and what's required. So um, increasingly now, cities have technology leaders and they have senior technology leaders. It's not unusual for medium to large size city to have a CIO and a CTO to have a 
a chief did um, a, a chief um, data officer, you know, uh, uh, to have um, an enterprise architect, to have business analysts, you know, data analysts, um, the kind of staff you would see in a private organization is not unusual now to be seen in a city, in a public uh, a context, a public agency. Um, and, and so, by the way, what that means is there's lots of opportunities for technology people in cities, lots. Lots. Right. We don't have enough people. We need project not... managers who are in the technology. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. Yes, I should probably say there is a massive, massive need for really good project managers uh, in the technology department and beyond, by the way. So uh, I want to get right to your answer to your question is a lot of the effort in building smarter cities because they have a technology component to them will fall into the IT department naturally. Now, the problem with doing that, if that's all you do, is that now you have to share capacity between running the city and building the city, right? Running the city and doing innovation. So let's not make the mistake of sort of putting them into the same pot. And now you're competing because the, the pothole, you know, or the, or the, or the uh, bridge that needs repair or the, the cell tower that needs to be upgraded, that's always going to get priority and you'll never do the innovation. So you have to... Uh, have uh, a, a nice um, spread of talent and allocation of resources for that. Now, the right answer at the end of the day is the smart city effort is not a technology effort and it should not be led by the CIO or CTO, right? That might be a surprise to many. Uh, there is this default sense that that's where it should live. Um, but I'm here to say, don't make that mistake. And I write about it in my book a lot. I write about it in in many of the in journals that I write for, is this is a all hands on deck. This belongs to the public works director. This belongs to the chief transportation official, the buildings official, uh, even the police chief. You know, there has to be ownership across the board because smart city activities are a multi-dimensional, multi-domain uh, effort. Um, now, ultimately, lead the the responsibility should should be with the elected council or whoever the equivalent uh, leadership is at the most senior level of your community. Um, there's no harm if your city is big enough that you have a chief innovation officer. There's no harm to have a smart cities director or smart cities leader. Uh, just don't have that person be the final stop right? I, I'd like to think of them as a very sophisticated project manager who is able to uh, herd all the cats and get everybody going the right direction, making sure tasks are being completed, you know, uh, measuring and, and reporting on uh, uh, achievements. Yes, for sure. And, and maybe it's important given the size and the priority of this work that you have somebody super focused on that. Um, uh, when we start uh, thinking about the uh, local governance, local governance for smart cities probably has to work with the private sector very closely, and there should be some partnership, and this will affect probably the systems like the electricity and other utilities. How do you see this partnership happening? You know, there's a, there's a story that I like to tell. Um, that, that is still relevant. Now, I didn't create the story. I, I stole it from somebody else. But we used to think of government like a vending machine. And in a vending machine, you, you insert your note. In the case of the US, you insert a dollar bill and you get a dollar's worth of product. The machine dispenses a can of Coke or Pepsi, <laughs> whatever your drink is. And you said, for my $1, I get a drink. And people would think often, uh, and have historically that government is like a vending machine. I put in my taxes and I get services back. And I want all my dollar to be services that come back. But what has happened is cities and government has become more complex and there's more and more overhead. For every dollar you put in, maybe you're getting, I don't know, again, making this up, 50 cents, 40 cents, maybe 30% value back. The bottom line is there's no such thing anymore as you know, you pay into it, you get the value back. The only way that cities can deliver today successfully is by partnerships, is by partnering with a variety of stakeholders and having established uh, multidimensional uh, contracts that make things happen. We need these because government doesn't have enough money alone, right? 
We need money from the private sector. We need money from the federal. We need pri- um, uh, 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 money. F- uh, we need loans that are um, that are uh, um, that are forwarded by these uh, uh, partnerships or advanced, I should say, by partnerships. <clears throat> uh, and and government doesn't have the expertise often, right? Uh, but what government does well, it's an incredible convener. In fact, it's an incredible project manager. Is, is, you know, if you think about what a good government does, it project manages, right? Uh, and, and, um, and so what you need is a collection of stakeholders, a collection of uh, partnerships. And what we call these, we call these you know, PPPs, public-private partnerships. And, and they are the desired modality for delivering government in the 21st century. Um, so you ask, you know, for example, about utilities. Uh, I think of something like the deployment of 5G, right? Think about mm-hmm. 5G. <clears throat> this might be, you know, the, right now, the most important telecommunications project in the world, right? As we upgrade communities, not only, you know, um, upgrade 5G from 4G or 3G, but actually implement it for the first time. Many communities are getting high-speed telecom for the very first time. <clears throat> and, you know, you could say, you know, government, we're hands-off. You know, private sector, you come in, just do it. Um, or you could say, you know, I'm a city, we're going to do it all ourselves, it's going to take a long time. Private sector, you know, we don't want your involvement. Neither of those are, are optimal. And we, we've seen lots of examples around the world where none of them, both uh, of those extremes are not the right path. The right path is to say, you know, we're city X and we want to have the best connectivity for our community. We want people to have good, fast, access to the internet and, and to voice, you know, good quality voice calls and just good connectivity. By the way, an essential prerequisite of a smart city is, is a digital infrastructure. It's good connectivity. Um, and so you sit down, the government sits down with the partners, maybe it's the several telecom, maybe it's one telecom, whatever the model is. And then you map out, how do we do this together? What can we bring as a city? What can we bring as our qualities? to make it happen in a efficient way, in a, in, a, in a less disruptive, in a way, by the way, that brings in lots of voices because you want people in the neighborhoods to have a say. And then you say, what can you bring as a telecom company? Can you bring good technology? You know, uh, how can you, for example, ensure that not only are you bringing 5G to the wealthy neighborhoods, but you're also bringing 5G to the less wealthy and the, and the parts of the community which are underserved or not served at all today. Right. In fact, as a city, we're going to make that a requirement. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're going to come and deploy your 5G in our community, we want you to give it to everybody. And that plays towards the uh, equality and equity and inclusion topics I've introduced earlier in our conversation. Um, partnerships, absolutely key. That's how you get stuff done. Amazing. And actually, the smart cities will bring new businesses, most likely. What new yeah. businesses? you think it will bring? Well, we have an interesting uh, example of that here in the US. Um, it, just in terms of fast connectivity, that can be very attractive. Uh, there, there was a community, there is a community in the US in, in, a, in a state called Tennessee. It's a, a city called Chattanooga. Mm-hmm. And Chattanooga was, uh, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful city in a beautiful part of the country. And you know, historically, it's been a it's been a industrial sort of mining town, uh, sort of more of, more of an old world. And of course, as th- times have changed and, and manufacturing has declined here in the U.S. and um, some of it's been outsourced to other countries, and just the dynamics of the economy changed. A city like Chattanooga was characteristic of many communities around the United States that started to decline. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't have enough jobs. People left. There was unemployment. There was uh, lower revenue, and so the city declined. Um, well, what they decided to do said, well, how do we bring people back? How do we create economic opportunity? How do we create economic activity? And so they said, we're going to be one of the first cities in the United States to have the fastest internet in the city. And so they were, were very creative. They, 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 um, they partnered with their um, utility, in this case, the uh, the electrical company and the, and the sort of major city uh, uh, utility. And they, they said, we're going to spend some money, a sizable amount of money, like make a bet. 
And we're going to try to get gigabit, gigabit to everybody as, as much as we can in a low cost. And the rest of the country were watching. Could a community, could, could a declining community like Chattanooga be a model for how you deploy fast gigabit internet or faster? And can you then attract an, enough economic engagement from elsewhere to make it all worthwhile? And their little experiment worked. That really worked. People started to move because they wanted better internet, and and that was a quality of life issue. And then uh, businesses started coming because there was talent, and then because there was businesses there, talent that came in too. So it started to have this economic uh, catalyst uh, quality to it. Um, as people sort of think about where they want to live, uh, you know, and a new generation of of people, our Generation Zs and beyond, Generation Next, um, they're thinking very differently about their lives and their work. They're going to have multiple jobs during their life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no longer just you know one job from the age of twenty to you know, sixty-five, but they're going to have multiple jobs. They're probably going to have information-based jobs, so they'll be on the internet using digital computers. They may not have to have a geograph geographic limitation anymore, so they can live anywhere. Let's say in the U.S. Um, so now it becomes a lot more competitive for communities. What do we have to do to attract the best talent uh, when people have options of where they can live? <clears throat> and we know that uh, this, these generations want, first of all, very good internet access. <laughs> they want to have, for example, good delivery services. It turns out that, um, you know, particularly here in the US, I don't know what it's like in Tbilisi. I think it's probably the same. Um, people are ordering everything now. Uh, you know, on the, yeah, okay. Uh, especially so, after the pandemic and COVID, everybody's ordering. Yeah, so exactly, exactly. Um, people want there to be parks, and I, I include beautiful parks in smart cities. You know, um, squares. You know, places that people gather. Nice, nice restaurants. Um, so the, let's not separate these two topics. They are the same topic. The Making our cities smarter, more sustainable is, is directly correlated with economic opportunity and for attracting people and businesses. When you talked about this uh, um, uh, former mining city, we have the same city in the Western Georgia. And I thought about having an internet, high-speed internet, that how it will attract the, the, the maybe travelers, maybe who, work, who will work from there. It, it's a very uh, good idea. Uh, Jonathan, it is amazingly engaging and interesting conversation and time flies and we have already uh, exceeded the limit and I want to give a chance to our participants to uh, ask uh, the questions we have left about 12 minutes and the questions which we have. Uh, Iraqli, what are the three main trends citizens should follow to promote the smartness of their city? Iraqli, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> maybe a bit repetitive, but certainly uh, data is, is, a, is a key component. Um, you know, do you, have, as, a, as a community member, have access to your city's data? Uh, is it in a machine consumable format? Uh, can you build innovation on top of that data? I think... Uh, uh, that's important. Can you make decisions or can you understand your city better? Uh, so, so if the answer, by the way, to all those questions is no, then you're probably not living in a smart city yet. Um, it, it, a city that when you request data gives you a PDF <laughs> or gives you a printed document, that still is a city that, need, that, that has a journey ahead, right? So I think that the, the, probably in the number one is data. Number two, um, would be the sustainability uh, uh, goals and, and movements. You know, is your city engaged in uh, carbon reduction, carbon emission reduction? Um, you know, what, what's been done to measure air quality and uh, to be able to understand the quality of water, uh, you know, drinking water? Um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the broader goals around, um, you know, meeting the United Nations sustainability development goals, the 17 goals there. Well, to what degree is your community and city uh, uh, prioritizing and actioning those? I think that's the second trend to, to be engaged in or to, 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 to monitor. Um, 
you know, there could be a long list here. I, I think probably the third easy one would be digitalization. It will be, you know, uh, you know, what percentage of common city services are digitized versus those that are still paper, you know, and what could you do? How could you help move that forward? You don't, by the way, always have to build a solution and sell it to your city. You can build a solution and sell it to your citizens. You, know, you, can, you can bypass the city. Um, you can have very interesting business models where um, you don't have to sell it, right? There's advertising, of course, but there's also, um, you know, if you're selling, for example, a, uh, an event management system or a ticketing system for a community, could you make your revenue by slicing just a little fee from the top of each transaction? Um, so I think that's probably uh, the third one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. The question comes from Shota Katamatze. Uh, uh, actually, the question is that for the city to become a smart city, uh, does it depend on the decentralization of level in the governance, uh, how it is decentralized, the city? Yeah, it is a great question because, <clears throat> um, you know, cities, if you think about my example a few minutes ago, where I was talking about the difference between the private sector and the and the public sector, you know, the private sector, everybody is marching to the same orders. Everybody's reporting to the same CEO. The hierarchy is pretty much like a pyramid. Um, when you get into big cities, this doesn't really apply to a small city. Those are more intimate, more manageable. But the minute you get into a, a city of 100,000 people or 200,000 or more, the city bureaucracy becomes more complicated. It becomes more decentralized. Uh, there are more uh, 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 reporting relationships. Um, you know, there, there, there's no person that says this is the way it's going to be and that's the way it is. Um, some communities have very strong mayors. Um, you know, we, we have uh, uh, different types of government here in the U.S. where in some cities you have a, a, you know, a strong mayor base and you have another one which is strong city manager based. Um, so there are different, you know, uh, governance structures. Part of it will depend on that. But here's why it's hard. It's like, how do you get everybody to agree on a common mission? How do you get the public safety guys, you know, the police and the fire service to get on the same page as the library, mm -hmm. you know, or the parks and recreation team? This is, this is a hard problem. Um, uh, often it comes from... Uh, a dialogue between the community and the city leadership. Often it comes down to themes rather than having, uh, you know, really specific requirements out of each department, everybody marches towards an, uh, a specific direction. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> we already know that <clears throat> data is really valuable when it comes to advancing the objectives of a city and making a smart, more sustainable community. Um, what you can do is rather than say, you know, you know, fire, you have to do this, buildings, you have to do this, you know, healthcare, you have to do this. Um, the theme is uh, where we have data that is, uh, uh, um, is basically unprotected or unregulated data, we make that open, make that available by default. We call this, by the way, open data by default. And I was, you know, one of the first people in the world in, in Palo Alto to implement this, and it was a great success story. And many, many cities do it today. <clears throat> That's how you get, you start to get people who are sort of decentralized with different priorities begin to contribute towards a larger mission is you have these theme-based objectives. Uh, uh, and so that doesn't say to, you know, the fire service, how do you do it? Although there can be some principles and, and some guidelines, um, not even like uh, necessarily you have to do tomorrow, but by 2025, um, your, your department should deliver data open by default. Um, so that, that's one of the ways you can tackle this question. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Here comes another question uh, from D.A. Ivanishvili uh, that, um, that the digital transformation and smart cities will affect energy, transport, utilities, and, and so on. What about the private residences? How this will affect and what is your vision about private ecological homes? Look, if, if what we're doing is not benefiting, benefiting people, we shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> the bottom line here is every single effort should be benefiting homeowners and, and, and residents and, and visitors, right? And, and businesses. 
Uh, the whole purpose of smarter, more sustainable communities is to deliver a higher quality of life to people, right? Um, you know, so let, let's not lose sight of the purpose. You know, um, I, uh, I wrote a book, as you know, the, the Smart Cities for Dummies, which is the you know, leading book on this topic. And people think it's a book all about technology. Well, yeah, there's a lot of technology. But the first line in the book is, this is a book about people. Mm -hmm. The first line of the book is, this is a book about people. I could have said, this is a book about emerging technology. It's about digital. No. So, you know, wh when we deploy uh, self -driving, when self-driving vehicles come and, and drones and uh, 5G and, um, you know, digital services, if we're not asking the question, how are we better serving people? Mm -hmm. How are we making sure we don't damage the environment? You know, how are we creating more opportunity for inclusion? Then we're making a, a, a very, very big mistake. How do you do that? Well, you have everyone engaged. This work comes back to this notion of community engagement, right? You can't make these decisions at city hall. You can't make them in a vacuum. You got to bring people, all types of people into a conversation, a regular conversation. And what you do has to reflect the needs of your community. Actually, the book that you just showed, The Smart Cities for Dummies, actually, I have uh, acquired this book and I have read actually, and it is so uh, user friendly and gives so much intel and it's really, really amazing. And I would recommend to anybody who is interested in this topic to go for, for this book. And I also saw your new book, uh, Smart Cities uh, um, for the Kids coming and it's also amazing. Uh, I'd love to see it uh, shortly. Uh, we have a question about uh, uh, from the chat. Is there any realistic time frame for the city transformation? It really depends on every individual city. You know, um, uh, there's, there's lots to think about. First of all, is the funding available or, you know, does the funding have to be spread over many more years? Uh, what's the urgency? You know, if if uh, <clears throat> if you have some very very weak infrastructure, you may want to do that more urgently. Um, uh, if your goals are uh, related to carbon uh, emission reduction by 2030, um, you may have to do that. You know, more aggressively to meet targets by 2030. Mm -hmm. um, so there isn't any universal timeline or anything. No. What, what's important, for example, to Tbilisi will again be different from Rome or Sydney, Australia, or Moscow in Russia. Um, each city has its own needs, its own deliverables. I will say this though, you know, the world is committed to the 17 you know, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, uh, and they are very specific, very time-driven, <laughs> very specific. So uh, um, that would be one, uh, probably the most important benchmark for any uh, uh, national government and, and by extension, its uh, its cities. And uh, most likely, there should be some vision uh, and the plan, long term plan for the digital transformation uh, for at the local government level. Yeah, we have a question. We have two more minutes left, and we have lots of questions. And I'll That's try. Okay. To Cover, cover them. Uh, question from Octavian. Smart niti, cities need smart inhabitants. So the level of innovation should suit not their needs only, but their technical skills as well too. How do you determine the level of innovation in such, case, <clears throat> such cases? So. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a fascinating question. Um, you know, society exists uh, with uh, multiple generations at once. Mm -hmm. Right. We have, you know, the uh, the baby boomers, <laughs> you know, we have Generation X. That's my one. You know, we've millennials, Generation Y, Generation Z, Generation Next, you know, and each one has a different set of needs um, and different level of digital competency. I mean, uh, I'm not a digital native, you know, I, I'm quite young, but I wasn't born into a world with the Internet, you know, um, Whereas a child born today will only oh, no. know. <laughs> I will only know. Uh, a child born today will only know a world that is digital and connected. Um, so, it, you know, th this is one of those dimensions of 
cities that are unique, right? You know, if, if you if you're Facebook, right? We've got a lot of people watching on Facebook right now. Mm-hmm. And your Facebook company, your assumption is that all your users can use the internet, right? That all your users have access to a browser or a smartphone or a other another type of internet connection. There's an assumption that the user base has the competency to use that product. We can't make the same assumption uh, in, in our communities, and, and we do have to offer up uh, different services. What we can say, though, is I think it's fair. As time passes, as new generations emerge and older generations pass on, um, we have to make a baseline assumption. You know, at some point, we have to assume that everybody has access to the internet. Right. Uh, we have to assume that pretty much everybody knows how to use a smartphone or has uh, uses, you know, a browser. Um, the same way is, you know, I think most people know how to use an elevator. You know, or, or everybody knows how to maybe get a plane, go to an airport, you know, buy a ticket, fly a plane. There, there are some basic and competency um, uh, qualities that communities have. So uh, in the short term, I think the question is, is essential. We have to del- develop and deliver for a variety of competencies. We have to assume that nobody, that, 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 that people won't know how to use it. Some people will be really good at it. But as time passes, I think we can make a, a baseline assumption that uh, digital services are going to be understood. Yeah. Two more questions, Jonathan. Sure. And we're done. Uh, Natak Akabadze is asking, what kind of services smart cities may offer to people with disabilities? <clears throat> Well, you've heard me probably use the word inclusion a lot, right? I, I, I've learned uh, to make sure that this is part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, those of us who uh, aren't, you know, who, who, who are, um, who don't have a disability are a small proportion of the planet. And let me put it that way. Uh, the, the, the statistics are quite, uh, um, unusual in that uh, a large proportion of humans on the planet live each day with some limitation, whether it's their ability to walk or to see or to hear, uh, to breathe, you know, without support, um, you know, to have mental um, limitations, uh, you know, any number of things. So we, we can't build for one small part of society. Mm-hmm. We, we're, that's not right, right? <laughs> we have to build for society that serves people. And we have to celebrate the differences of all of us, you know? And, and that takes the form not of empty promises, but things like uh, being able to access all buildings by everybody. You know, the, don't build a building that has steps. You know, only steps where a person with a wheelchair can't access it. Um, you know, don't assume that everybody can see well. You know, you've got to have audio uh, built into your, your infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had the real pleasure of visiting uh, Japan a few years ago, um, a place I've, I've always wanted to spend time. And one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I knew that Japan would be a different experience for me coming from the United States and Europe. And, and I saw pictures and I understood. But one thing that I wasn't prepared for when I got to the city, for example, Tokyo or Osaka, was the degree to which audio is used. And whether it's on the train station or even in a park to direct people with uh, uh, blindness or, or, or lack of sight to a bathroom, there was a certain sound that would be happening in a park. And so, you know, you think about it, if you can see perfectly, and there's no sound, you know where the bathroom is. Right? You just see it. You can see there's the bathroom. But if you are visiting the park and you can't see and you need the bathroom, how do you get to it? Right. Um, so they have these little sounds. And that to me is, and that's been going for decades already, that is inclusive of, the, the, sorry, characteristic of cities thinking about inclusion uh, in a very deep way and baking it, making it part of everything. And universal design is, is a lovely way of saying it. Thank you for sharing that. I see that in the chat there, universal design. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. And we have a question from our friend from Azerbaijan, Fahri Abbasov. 
Sure. Uh, Azerbaijan is creating, the question is that Azerbaijan is creating smart villages and cities on the liberated place uh, lands. How many people a town needs uh, so the investment for a smart system pays back? In other words, what is ROI, ROI time of smart town for 250,000 people? Oh, uh, <clears throat> such an interesting question, but impossible to answer um, with that information. Uh, and, and, and it's not, a, it's not a, for me sort of saying, I don't know the answer. That, that's not me jumping out. Um, it, 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 it's, it's me being honest and saying every community has a multitude of dimensions you've got to evaluate when determining, you know, what the economic prospects are for that community uh, and, and, and everything's going things that you have to think about are going to be um, uh, 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 the uh, integration of uh, things like logistics and transportation and and internet quality it's going to be things like the geography and the climate <laughs> it's going to be uh, things like amenities you know uh, quality of education um uh, language uh yeah you know, so you, i would be happy to have that conversation but i think it requires a, somewhat of a deep dive to to to, to figure it out um you know yeah. it, it's a complicated deep yeah. important question lots of variables and uh, lots of dependencies and as you mentioned it's uh, uh, varies from countries regions cultures and so on and so on uh, wow, it was an amazing journey. It was so interesting and I'm so thankful uh, for uh, this engaging uh, conversation. Time flies and we are already over six minutes of hour. We, I think, covered most of the questions, all of the questions. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It was my pleasure to, uh, to be on live with you and talk about the smart cities. I would like to thank everybody who participated participated and was ready and was engaged in the chat and listened to this conversation. Uh, I would like, uh, I would be happy to uh, see you and serve you. And if you um, sign up for my accounts on LinkedIn, I will be posting the interesting uh, topics about digital transformation, project management, leadership. Uh, so please follow me. And um, uh, we will be sending the forum for the feedback uh, to improve our future sessions. So thank you very much again. Thank you very much, uh, Leila, myself. I, I had such a great time and lovely questions and, and, and terrific dialogue there in the chat and probably lots on Facebook too. Um, if you enjoyed what I had to say and you're intrigued by this topic, I, we've shared here in the chat, but just for others joining us through different channels, uh, www.smartcitybook.com is my uh, is the way you can get to my book, my my dummies book. Uh, but as you mentioned, Leila, I have a children's book coming out on the future of cities uh, that you can buy for your children. I think they're gonna love it. It's an activity book with games, puzzles, and things. And you'll see it's smartcitybook.com forward slash kids kids. And um, if you sign up, I, there's, we we got a massive discount for everyone signing up. So uh, thank you so much for the privilege of being part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, once again. And for, thank you for your time and for being here today. Wish you a pleasant and lovely rest of the day. Thank you.